Welcome to our podcast series, Five Questions, Five Answers. We explore current U.S. trade policies and trade rules impacting thousands of companies. My name is Bridget Matisson. I'm the Director of North American Manufacturing here at Aaron Fox Schiff in Washington, D.C. With the help of my guests, who I know will have the right answers, we translate the legal into real-world strategies. Our goal? Help business leaders understand the rules while increasing their bottom line. Let's start. If you're in the electric vehicle sector, one of the hottest policy topics coming out of Washington, D.C., and particularly in that sector, is the Inflation Reduction Act, or the IRA. It was heralded as the most ambitious legislative action to address climate change, and the IRA therefore presents enormous tax incentives for the production and purchase of clean vehicles. All of this having started already in January of this year. Congress passed it in 2022, the president signed it, and now it's up to Treasury and the IRS folks to actually implement it and get the monies out the door. That hasn't happened yet, but it will soon. The IRA requires quote unquote proposed rulemaking to be issued by next month. We'll see if they meet that deadline. What we do have is a January proposed guidance paper from Treasury. What we do know is that the administration is not seeking formal comments from the private sector quite yet. They won't until they're ready to to issue these proposed rules. But they are currently, as they put it, welcoming stakeholder input. So for those of you who uh, need a quick recap, here's the deal. The IRA gives a tax credit up to $7,500 at the point of sale for each new qualifying EV. Remember that word, qualifying. And so what does that word mean? It means, first, North American assembly requirement. Uh, For half of that amount, starting in uh, 2023, 50% of the value of the battery component has to be manufactured or assembled in North America, and that's going to rise to 100% by 2029. For the other half, starting in 2023, 40% or at least 40% of the critical mineral components of the battery has to be extracted or processed in the U.S. or a country that is party to a U.S. free trade agreement. More on that later. Also must be could be recycled in North America. This percentage rises to a whopping 80% by 2027. Also, some more battery sourcing restrictions important in their own right exclude inputs from quote unquote foreign entities of concern. We can imagine what these might be. The IRA also has uh, advanced manufacturing production credits investment tax credits for establishing U.S. manufacturing facilities, and additional tax credits for used and commercial electric vehicles. Now, some U.S. trading partners aren't happy. Those would be the EU, South Korea, Japan, maybe others. Uh, The Biden administration and Congress are well aware of these concerns from our trading partners. A task force has been set up, no news on any developments from that force. And the question at top of mind for many trade policy wonks is, given that these U.S. trading partners are unhappy, will they, could they, should they launch trade action in 2023 or beyond? The IRA, simply put, is a game changer for the EV sector. Hence, why the rules will be important to watch and to understand. So while we wait, I ask my colleague, Sam, short for Samantha, overly of our firm's tax practice to summarize what she's learned and her thoughts of what we might expect. So let's get to it. First of all, Sam, thank you so much for agreeing to join us for the next 20 minutes. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. You know, I was recently in Toronto speaking at the Electric Autonomy Canada conference, and the IRA 
was top of mind and was a topic most folks wanted to talk about and hear about. So where are we in terms of the IRA implementation? What are your best guess on the timing of when we can see these all important proposed rules? So Treasury has started issuing guidance on certain matters under the IRA. Some of the guidance has pertained to electric vehicles, and some of it has pertained to other areas. Uh, For example, the IRA created new labor standards uh, for some of the tax credits, referred to as the prevailing wage and apprenticeship guidelines. Uh, Treasury has issued some guidance on how those requirements should be met. Um, specific to electric vehicles, uh, Treasury has issued guide, guidelines, uh, did issue guidelines at the end of 2022 to help taxpayers determine whether a vehicle qualifies in the categories of vehicles, such as sedans, SUV, um, and other types of vehicles that are subject to uh, MSRP limitations. Um, Earlier that month in December, Treasury issued guidelines uh, for the administrative process related to claiming the electric vehicle credits, such as what information vehicle manufacturers must provide to Treasury um, and what information a seller of a used electric vehicle must provide in its report to a buyer. So we've started to see some guidance, but there's much, much more uh, we're waiting on and we expect to be rolled out over time. Uh, There's not a lot of specific dates that the IRS or Treasury has given in terms of promised uh, guidance. There are some instances where taxpayers can expect it because the IRA itself said something like Treasury must issue guidance within six months of enactment. Um, But we just hit the six-month mark, um, and so some of that guidance has been released, um, but we're waiting on uh, much more. Uh, As you said earlier, um, at the end of December, Treasury uh, issued like a proposed guidance paper uh, where they talked about some of the electric vehicle guidance that will be coming out, they're hoping, in March, uh, specific to the critical mineral and battery component requirements. Um, which, as you said, will determine the exact amount um, and how uh, that will be determined uh, for critical minerals extracted or processed in in North America um, and uh, battery manufacture and assembly um, in North America. And those rules will apply for vehicles that are placed in service in 2023, but after the guidance is issued. So um, those standards won't be, won't apply to vehicles before that's issued. Um, So our sense overall is that we'll see a lot more guidance coming up in the second quarter uh, this year and probably also the third quarter. But some of that guidance may take longer just because of the sheer volume required um, in this massive piece of legislation. So you're close to this whole process. You're talking to 100 people. You're probably talking to the administration. Of the IRA generally, that, and the, what we do know so far, what are some of the provisions that you've heard that are more controversial than others? Sure. So I would say that there's more uncertainty than controversy uh, surrounding the provisions, but there are areas that are getting a lot of attention. Um, specifically, the there's multiple provisions in the IRA that require American or North American assembly standards, even beyond uh, the electric vehicle credit. Um, there's also a domestic content bonus um, in some areas of the various credits uh, that require that steel, iron, or a manufactured product um, that's a component of a facility, uh, that that is produced in the United States. And it's unclear right now if that means every single piece of steel that makes up a component of a facility must be produced in the United States or whether certain more granular components could be imported as long as the majority of the component is produced in the United States. So, um, you know, similar to extraction of critical minerals in the United States, everyone is wondering how are these assembly standards going to be interpreted um, and administered because Um, As of right now, a lot of businesses import some of their materials because it's been cost prohibitive um, to source exclusively within the United States. 
Um, but one of the goals is the I- of the IRA is to make the United States more independent of the global supply chain. So there's a a, a mixing uh, that's going to occur between implementing these standards, but making them uh, reasonable so that taxpayers can actually achieve uh, claiming some of these credits. Sam, I know you're a tax uh, attorney, uh, but let me put my ta- uh, trade policy hat on for just a moment. I'm taken by a couple of things. Uh, one is the injection of U.S. labor policy and uh, um, in the IRA. We saw that first in the USMCA um, uh, uh, on wage rates, for example. Uh, and this seems to be another reiteration or another iteration, I should say, of, um, of using uh, uh, U.S. domestic policy to uh, advance their uh, economic and their social approaches. It also is the same. There's, uh, there's that nexus between the IRS and the Treasury on the proposed definitions, as you put it, uh, for North American assembly uh, domestic content. These are all buzzwords and trigger words in the trade policy arena as well. And so I'm curious whether it's going to be the IRS that would certify IRA compliance with such definitions as North American assembly rather than CBP? So it's, it's a good question, um, but ultimately these standards have to be interpreted by Treasury and the IRS. So it, it will be them um, in the end. But I know that Treasury and the IRS are working very closely with other agencies to grasp uh, these standards and how they're going to affect taxpayers. So they are working very closely with the Department of Energy. Uh, Customs and Border Control um, and other energy or and other you know energy related um, agencies that would have a say on these matters um, to help them understand and interpret in the best way possible. Many folks, uh, much smarter than I, um, are predicting that in terms of electric vehicle production, it'll be commercial vehicles that will. Uh, take off sooner and 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 wider than uh, electric vehicles for private use, only because fleets need more electric vehicles. And so that's uh, you know scooters to uh, last mile uh, trucks and vans. Um, so because of that, could I ask you just to define or the way the IRA defined? What is a commercial vehicle? And what's this I'm hearing that commercial vehicles might include leased vehicles? Yeah, so there's a separate tax credit um, available under the IRA for commercial vehicles that are placed in service during a tax year. Um, There's a somewhat broad definition of commercial vehicle um, that it can be a motor vehicle as defined for purposes of the Clean Air Act. Uh, which is manufactured primarily for use on public streets, roads, and highways, or could also be, quote, mobile machinery. Uh, The mobile machinery point is interesting because that could include equipment like forklifts um, and commercial lawnmowers. Uh, But there is a VIN requirement uh, for commercial vehicles. Um, And as many people may know, uh, equipment like forklifts forklifts and commercial lawnmowers would not have a VIN number. So that's another area that we're waiting on guidance on um, for how this mobile machinery might qualify as a commercial vehicle for purposes of this credit. Um, But there is also uh, the possibility under the credit um, to get credit for uh, leased vehicles. Um, And in this case, the credit uh, would be available to the lessor uh, not the lessee. So the person or business that ultimately owns uh, the equipment, they may be eligible um, if for the credit, even if they lease the equipment to someone else. That last, Sam, is going to be very interesting to a number of companies we're, um, we're working with right now. Um, uh, can I just get back to trade policy for a moment? Because, you know, that's what I know about. Um, It's the IRA's term that they use, uh, quote unquote, foreign entities of concern uh, that would 
preclude uh, any of the IRA benefits. I'm assuming China would be in that mix. Um, Am I correct? And uh, are you hearing any other trading partners that might be in the mix? And when would this exclusion uh, begin? Yeah, so this is also um, a very hot topic right now. Um, there's some big players who are in this area that are are looking to get guidance from Treasury on how this term foreign entity of concern uh, will be interpreted. Um, and this specifically affects the uh, electric vehicle credit um, and would provide that starting in 2024 to qualify for the credit, the vehicle may not contain any battery components that were manufactured um, by a foreign entity of concern. And then starting in 2025, uh, the battery may not contain any critical minerals sourced um, from a foreign entity of concern. Um, So right now, that standard applies to countries like China, as well as Iran, North Korea, Pakistan, Russia, and Saudi Arabia. Um, But that definition is created by uh, certain state agencies and can be um, amended over time. So we have a a small pool right now. Um, And so we'll see if that, that ever changes. Um, but as I said, certain interested taxpayers are, are working with Treasury on how to interpret this standard, and some are advocating that the standard be interpreted narrowly, uh, because again, we have a very global supply chain uh, that will directly affect taxpayers' ability to to claim this credit. Um, if this, you know, if the meaning of foreign entity of concern is interpreted too broadly um, to apply to Um, companies um, and joint ventures and any other business arrangement that may uh, include someone or some entity or one of the governments of these countries, um, that may create a a very steep uphill battle for taxpayers who are, are trying to qualify. And by taxpayers, Sam, you're talking about um, the U S the manufacturer uh, and the manufacturing company located in the United States who pay taxes. Right, right. Not- you have to think of the credits in terms of uh, every every point. So ultimately, you know, we get to the end user, but the end user wants to make sure that what they're purchasing uh, meets these standards. And so each uh, company within the, the chain will want to make sure that they're uh, satisfying the standards, uh, even if they themselves are not claiming the credit. Our time is up. Um, to our listeners, um, you know, I always strive to get you the best person to explain to us some of these very, very complicated issues that will have such an impact on your bottom line, your access to the U.S. market, and the uh, uh, cost savings uh, some of these policies can represent. I think Sam fits that bill. Um, so. Sam, uh, there's got to be a thousand questions that people want to ask you. How can they reach you? And uh, what's your phone number? Uh, Sure. Uh, Well, my contact information is uh, available on the Errant Fox Shift website, Um, of course, that includes my email address and phone number. Uh, My direct phone number is uh, 202-857-6016. Sam, thank you. Uh, We appreciate it so much. This has been too short of a time. Uh, Again, for our listeners, I think I've uh, convinced Sam to join one of our podcasts uh, again in the near future, possibly when some of uh, these proposed rules come out. So watch this space. Um, As a member of the uh, Aaron Fox Schiff Electric Vehicle Practice, We're going to continue working very, very closely with our new best friend, Sam, and her uh, colleagues. And why do we do that? It's to provide you, our listeners, with the most up-to-date information and our analysis. Why do we do it? Smart in your world. For us at Aaron Fox Schiff, it's not simply a tagline.